हेलो एवरीवन दिस इज डॉक्टर विशाल त्रिवेदी फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायो साइंसेज एंड इंजीनियरिंग आईआईटी गुवाहाटी एंड व्हाट वी वर डिस्कसिंग वी वर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द जीन क्लोनिंग एंड वी हैव डिस्कस अबाउट द डिफरेंट एस्पेक्ट व्हाट यू सपोज टू लर्न टू टू सक्सेसफुली परफॉर्म द जीन क्लोनिंग एंड इन दिस पर्टिकुलर डिस्कशन व्हाट वी हैव सेड दैट द फर्स्ट स्टेप ऑफ सक्सेसफुली परफॉर्मिंग द जीन क्लोनिंग इज दैट यू आर गोइंग टू आइडेंटिफाई द जीन ऑफ योर इंटरेस्ट now identification of the gene of interest can be done by multiple approaches uh it depends on the uh, on the whether the genomic sequences are known or it, whether the genomic sequences are not known right so if you recall in our previous lecture we discuss about how you can be able to identify the gene of interest when the genomic sequences are not known and in that case you are supposed you 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 are actually going to have the two options one where you are actually going to develop the genomic library or in the second option you can actually be able to develop or generate a cdna library screening of either of these libraries utilizing the different types of screening tools such as the dna fragments activity or the antibody uh, will let you to identify a particular gene now in the second approach you what you can do is if the genomic sequences are known then you can be able to uh, amplify the gene of your interest utilizing the site specific primers and this technique is known as the polymerase chain reactions now in today's lecture we are going to discuss about the second approach which is where we are actually going to understand how you can be able to perform the polymerase chain reactions what are the different requirements of the polymerase chain reactions and in what way you can be able to uh, modify the polymerase chain reactions so that you can be able to address and understand the different types of questions and at the end of this particular lecture we are also going to understand how the polymerase chain reactions can be used to diagnose the different types of diseases such as covid-19 so uh, what you see here is that we have enlisted the different types of the uh, approaches right so in we 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 are supposed to discuss about the polymerase chain reactions now what is mean by the polymerase chain reactions polymerase rea chain reaction is the set of reactions which will allow you to amplify a uh, uh double stranded dna molecules with the same size and the sequence by the enzymatic method and the cyclic conditions so you can understand that if this is a template right what we are saying that with the help of the polymerase chain reactions you can be able to make the multiple copies of the same sequence and the uh, with the same size and the same sequence so you can actually be able to make the multiple copies like the copy number 1 copy number 2 copy number 3 right and uh, how, why it is happening so it is happening because the dna has the uh, is a, is a, is a wonderful molecules right and it has the biochemical properties which will allow you to exploit uh, the these uh, strands in such a way that you can be able to synthesize the exactly the identical copy and uh, so what you see here is that dna is complementary in nature and i'm sure when you were when you have studied the the biomolecules in your biology course you have you have uh, you have understood the or discussed the many properties of the dna right dna is made up of of the deoxyribonucleic acids dna is uh, complementary in nature dna is double stranded and it is been uh, both the strands of the dna is been hold together by the hydrogen bonding between the bases and so on now what we are going to discuss is about the complementarity within the dna what is mean by the complementarity complementarity means that you are actually going to have the complementary nucleotides present on the two strands now for let's take an example for example this is a primary strand okay so this is the primary strand this is the strand number 1 which is a primary strand now what is mean by the complementary is that wherever you have the g you are going to have the c and wherever you have the t you are going to have the a and wherever you have the c you are going to have the g why it is so because the a is making double base the, the two hydrogen bonding with t and g is making 
treats hydrogen bonding with C. Why it is so? Because of the simple uh, chemistry that A is not making a pair with C and G is not making a pair with T because of the steric hindrance between the bases if you are taking the two bulky bases or the short or the, uh, the the distances between the true strand does not allow the making of the hydrogen bonding between the two smaller bases. You know that the, uh, the, the purines are the uh, one, cha one chain right one ring uh, structures whereas the pyrimidines are the two ring structures. So, if you are taking a combination of two purines then it will actually going to have a gap. If you take the two uh, pyrimidines then there will be a steric hindrance and that is why only a one purine and another pyrimidine can make a pair with each other and that is why there is a strict base pairing between the different nucleotides. So, A is making a pair with T, G is making a pair with C. So, if you have the information about the primary strand which means this strand you can be able to generate the information about the sequence what is present on to the complementary strand because wherever you have G you can actually be able to put C, wherever you have C you can put the G, wherever you have T you can put A and wherever you have A you can put T and that is how you can be able to generate the complementary strand. This is the null main basis of the DNA synthesis. So, where what 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 the enzyme is doing it, it is actually in uh, reading the sequence which is present on the top surface of top uh, primary strands and then it is attaching the nucleotide in the same sequence complementary to each other. So, for example, if you have G it is going to add C and so on and I am sure uh, you might have also studied the DNA applications right. So, this is exactly what happens during the DNA applications. The two strand when you have the two strands they are actually going to be first they are actually going to be broken right. So, you are actually going to have the two strands of DNA which are bound to each other by the hydrogen bonding between the bases. So, first will happen what will happen is the protein are actually going to bind the DNA right. So, they will go and bind the DNA and then they will actually going to the break the hydrogen bonding between the bases. So, they will actually going to break the hydrogen bonding as a result of this they are actually going to be far apart right and then the opening of the double helix DNA is happened. So, this is the first step that you are going to have the initiation then you are going to have the elongation which means the the enzyme is going to sit and then it is going to read what is present on this side and then it is actually going to start adding the nucleotides. So, protein connects the correct sequence of the nucleotide into a continuous new strand of the DNA. Remember that the DNA synthesis is always in the direction of 5 prime to 3 prime. So, this it will start from this side because this is going to be 3 prime and it is going to be 5 prime and then it is also going to start on this on this direction ok. And then once it, it reaches to the end of the sequence it is there will be a termination. So, there will be a protein going to be released from the replication complex. So, this is exactly what happens in the biological system right and in the biological system to perform these kind of events like the initiation, elongation and termination you are actually using the different types of proteins. So, what you are using you are using the helicases primase, SSB proteins, DNA polymerases and the tethering protein and all of these proteins are actually having the uh, distinct function. For example, helicases are going to separate the two strands so that the strand whatever the information is available on the strand in the form of nucleotide sequence is going to be uh, available for the subsequent enzyme to read. Then the primase is actually going to synthesize the primer and uh, then SSB protein will ensure that whatever the strands are being separated by the helicases are not going to come together again because you know that the, these, these strands are complementary to each other. So, if you have G here, you have C here, even if you have separated them and you, you will not ensure that they will remain separated, they will eventually going to come back again and they will form the hydrogen bonding. So, to avoid this you are actually putting the SSB protein and then DNA polymerase the job is the synthesis of the new strands and then the T3 protein are stabilizing the polymerases onto the DNA strands. So, this is all happening in the biological system where the temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Now, 
if you want you can actually be able to take the cocktail of these enzymes and you can be able to ut utilize them to perform the DNA synthesis under the in vitro conditions. But under the in vitro condition the regulation between the appearance of the helicases, primases, SSB protein, DNA polymerase and T3 protein is not possible because in the natural cases first the helicase will come then it is actually going to separate the two strands then the primase will come and it is actually going to synthesize the primer onto the 3 prime end then the ssb proteins will come and they will actually ensure that the two strands will remain separated and they will keep coming off when the dna polymerase is running then the fourth is the dna polymerase will come and it is going to synthesize the new strand and so on and then it is the t3 protein which are actually going to ensure that the dna polymerase should remain onto the template and should keep synthesizing the dna so, since they will come into a particular sequence and there is a machinery and there is a regulation by the uh, regu nucleus and the other trans other kind of uh, regulatory proteins, it is possible to utilize them under the biological system. Okay? But if you break open these cells and if you take out these proteins under the pure conditions and you try to do the DNA synthesis, it may happen but it may not happen in a regulatory manner. So, because so, what we can do is we can actually be able to perform all these events utilizing the in vitro physical conditions so that you can be able to avoid all these proteins except the DNA polymerases and so what you actually require to uh, uh, ensure is you are actually going to ensure that there will be a separation the DNA synthesis right. So, initiation in, in the within the initiation what you have you have to break the DNA into two strands right that is what you are supposed to achieve under the biological system and that you are going to do by simply heating the DNA right. So, if you heat the DNA the DNA is actually going or both the strands of DNA going to be get separated from each other right. So, if you heat the DNA at 95 degrees Celsius. Uh, it is actually going to be get broken and both the templates are going to be ready for you to go for the next stage. Then you within the elongation stage you are actually going to add the primers. Remember that in the biological system you actually have an enzyme called primase which is going to synthesize the primer, but in this case you are actually going to add the primer uh, externally. Okay? So, then the primer will go and sit here right? and then that you are actually going to add the DNA polymerase so that the DNA polymerase will come and sit here and it will start the synthesis for both the strands. And then once the DNA strand will reach here then you are actually going to enter into the third stage and that is the termination stage. So, it will actually going to synthesize the whole strand and it is actually going to come off. So, taking these uh, taking the inspiration from the DNA replication machinery and taking that many of the physical parameter can be used instead of using the enzyme people have started designing the different types of polymerases different types of uh, uh, thermal cyclers and so on and that is how they have developed uh, the polymerase chain reactions. So, there are series of discoveries which are very very important for understanding how the this particular technique of polymerase chain reaction is being developed. So, in your era I am not uh, uh, taking the comprehensive over this account of the all the discoveries which are uh, happening along with the polymerase chain reactions. I am just taking the important ones so that you understand how the people were actually doing the different types of experiments and how th that has evolved the polymerase chain reaction what we are using today on a daily basis and that is how it is actually become a such a powerful technique. So, in the year of 1950 there will be a discovery of the mechanism of DNA replication by the author Kornberg and he discovered that the DNA polymerase in an enzyme which and along with the prime helicases and primase which is required for the DNA replication. So, here in the year of 1950 people have discovered the DNA replications and uh, they found that the DNA replication is being done by an enzyme which is called as a DNA polymerase. Then the year of 1976 uh, the people have ice, uh, uh, st people have discovered the thermostable DNA polymerase from the thermos acuticus. Then year of 1983 uh, Kerry Muller synthesizes the DNA oligoprobe for the sickle cell anemia mutations. Then year of 1984 uh, 
Mullis and uh, Tom White tried the experiment to test the PCR for the genomic DNA, but the amplified product was not visible in the agarose gel. Then year of 1985, the patent was filed for the polymerase chain reaction and its application focusing on the sickle cell anemia mutations. And then in the year of 1985, the use of thermostable DNA polymerase in PCR was started out of only two enzymes, the TAC uh, known at the time, the TAC was found more suitable for the polymerase chain reactions. Then year of 1985, the first announcement of PCR technique in the Salt Lake City and then in the year of 1985 to 87, the people have developed the instrument for the PCR and its reagent. And the instrument what you use for the PCR is called as thermal cycler because it is actually going to change the different types of temperature as per your design. So, that is why it is going to be called as thermal cycler. Now, what is happening in a polymerase chain reactions? So, as I, as I discussed that right, we are actually going to have a double standard DNA, right? So, that is going to be uh, called as template okay now what will happen is in the first step you are going to have the denaturation so denaturation is going to be done as 95 degrees celsius so once you are going to heat the dna the the hydrogen bonding between the nucleotide is going to be broken and then it is actually going to separate it out in the two different templates okay so both of these templates are now going to receive the primer so what will happen is the primer is going to bind onto the uh, five prim, uh, 3 prime end right and then uh, the, pri the primer will bind on the both the templates right and then the uh, DNA polymerase is going to sit and it will run in the direction of 5 prime to 3 prime and the same is true for the, this one right is going to sit in the, the, the uh, run in the this direction and that is how you are actually going to get the two identical copies what you have started with okay so the, with the template you have started with one molecule uh, you are going to get the two molecule after the first cycle okay we in in between these two cycles you are going to have the different types of events like you have a denaturations elongations and all that so what you see here is that if you started with one molecule of the uh, dna as a template after the first cycle you are going to have the two molecules after second cycle you are going to have four molecule after third cycle you are going to have the eight molecule why it is so because after the first cycle you are going to have the two dna molecule now these two dna molecules when they will go for the denaturation they will actually going to form the four templates right template one template two template three template four and all these templates are now going to synthesized right and that is how you are actually going to get the 4 DNA molecule. Now, after the second cycle when the, you have 4 DNA molecules, they will get denatured. So, it actually going to give you the 8 templates, right? And all these 8 templates are going to synthesize and give you the DNA, double standard DNA. And that is how you are going to have the 8. If you go subsequent, so in the 4th generation, you are going to have 16. You will in the 5th uh, generation you are going to have 32 and so on and it is actually going to keep increasing in the same ratio. So, PCR is a repeated cycle reaction that involves the mechanism of DNA replication. It results in the production of multiple copy of the DNA from a single one. The whole process involves the three events denaturation, annealing and elongation. So, do not worry about these terminologies because that anyway we are going to discuss uh, in the subsequent uh, slides. So, what you are going to see is that the number of uh, amplified DNA or the ampli amplicons increase exponentially per cycle. Thus, one molecule of DNA will give rise to two molecules after first cycle, four molecules after second cycle, eight molecules after third cycle, uh, 16 after the fourth cycle and so on. This means it is actually going to give you the uh, logarithmic uh, amplifications. And if you want to calculate the amount of uh, amplified DNA, you can be able to use this particular equation. Now, this is what exactly what you are going to do when you are going to do the preliminary chain reactions, right? So, it actually going to have the uh, three steps, okay? You are going to have stage one, stage two, and stage three. In the stage 1, you are going to have the initial denaturations, right? And the initial denaturation is going to be performed by heating the PCR mixture at 94 degrees Celsius to 95 for 10 minutes to ensure the complete denaturation of the template DNA. 
Now, in the stage 2, you are going to have the 3 steps denaturation, annealing and elongations. So, in the stage 2, you are going to have another round of denaturation. So, this is the first step in which the double standard DNA template is denatured to form the 2 single standard strands by heating at 95 degrees Celsius for 15 to 30 seconds. So, you started with the template right. Now, what you are going to do is you are going to heat at 95 degrees Celsius. So, it is actually going to give you the 2 templates right template 1 template 2. Now, both of these templates are actually at 95 degrees Celsius. Now, what you are going to do is you are going to lower down the temperature and lower down the temperature at 56 degrees Celsius. This temperature is called as the annealing temperature and this annealing temperature also depends on to the uh, would vary from the primer to primer. So, you go with the annealing temperature and then uh, you are going to have the primer. So, uh, at this stage you are going to allow the primer to go and bind ok. So, your primer will come and bind on to the DNA. And then you will again going to increase the temperature at 72 degrees Celsius. So, that you are going to provide the enough activity uh, enough uh, energy into the system. So, that the enzyme will go and sit and it going to start synthesizing the DNA ok. Now, this stage is going to continue for many number of times. So, this is going to be called as like for example, here we are doing this for 30 cycle. So, once this is going to be done again the molecule will enter into this. So, it is actually going to run in a loop kind of conditions in the step 1 will after the step 1 you are going to have the step 2 after the step 2 it is going to have step 3 and from the step 3 again it will enter into the step 1 and how many times it will done it will be done for 30 cycles or 30 times. So, because of that it is actually going to keep increasing the number of templates into the reactions initially it is going to have one template right after first cycle you are going to have 2 templates after second cycle uh, third cycle you are going to have the 4 templates after so on. So, it is actually going to be keep increasing keep doubling the templates and that is how it is actually going to allow you to produce the or synthesize the or amplify the particular stretch of DNA uh, using the different types of the site specific primers. So, in the stage 2 you are going to have 3 events denaturations annealing and then elongations. Once the elongation this cycle is over then you will enter into the stage 3 and the stage 3 you are going to have the final annealing term final uh, synthesis right. So, you are going to have the extra elongations. So, that whatever the DNA is being left for getting the synthesized it is going to be synthesized in this particular step and then ultimately it is going to be uh, going to be asked to remain on to the final hold which is at 4 degree infinite. So, uh, after the cycles are completed the reaction is held at uh, 70 to 74 degrees Celsius for several minutes to allow the final extension of the remaining DNA and then at the stage 3 it is going to be remain on to the final hold. Now, if you want to perform the PCR reactions uh, you are going to set these uh, temperature conditions right. So, how you are going to set the temperature reactions you are going to have the initial denaturation that is 95 degrees Celsius for 5 minutes then you are going to have the stage 2 that is the 30 cycles. So, you are going to have the denaturation at 95 degrees Celsius for 30 seconds, then you are going to have the annealing at 55 degrees Celsius for 30 seconds. As I said the annealing is going to be dependent upon the is linked to be the primer sequences and it is also going to be related to the template. Then you are going to have the extension. So, it is going to be 72 degrees Celsius for 45 seconds. This is also uh, depends on the length of the uh, template or length of the amplified product because it depends on the uh, how much length of the DNA you want to amplify. So, according to this according to the uh, rough calculations you are actually going to have the 1000 base pair per minute uh, uh, amplification or extension. So, if you are synthesizing a gene with 1000 base pair you are supposed to give 1 minute and you can actually be able to calculate the extension time accordingly. Then you are going to have the stage 3 where you are going to have the final extension that is 72 degrees Celsius for 5 minutes and then you are going to have the final holding where you are going to keep the sample at 4 degree until you will not take out. Now, if you want to perform the polymerase chain reaction you require the different types of reagents. 
So what you require, you require a template DNA, you require the two different types of primers, you are going to have, you require the forward primers for the template 1, uh, sorry template uh, the strand 1 and you also require the reverse primer for the strand number 2. Then you also require the thermostable DNA polymerase, the examples are tag DNA polymerase uh, and uh, then you also require the thermal cyclers. Now this is a thermal cycler what you see, uh, what you have here is this is the heating block. This is the place where you are going to keep the different types of tubes and thermal cycler are actually being used to vary the temperature, right. You know, you, you see that the stage 1 we are going to have the 95 degrees Celsius, then in the stage 2 you have the 3 different types of temperature, the 95, 55, 72 and then the stage 3 you are going to have the 72 degrees Celsius for the final extension and the 4 degree for the hold. So, all these uh, variation of temperature is uh, possible when you are going to use a thermal cycler. Then you are going to have the mixture, right. So, for the polymerase chain reactions, you require the template DNA. The template DNA could be uh, different types, it could be a viral or the short templates, or it could be a genomic DNA. If it is a viral or the short templates, then you can take the amount as 1 picogram to 1 nanograms. But if it is a genomic DNA, then you should do it from 1 nanogram to 1 microgram. Then you require the primers. As I said, you require the two different primers, forward primers and the reverse primers. Forward primers for the strand 1, forward second uh, and the reverse primers for the strand number 2. And this is the concentration of the each primer. Then you also require the magnesium chloride. Magnesium chloride is a cofactor for the tag DNA polymerase. So, you require the 1.5 to 2 millimolar that is for the tag DNA polymerase and then you also require the DNTPs. DNTPs are the building blocks, right, you, because if there is a G, you are supposed to add the C, right, that, that C will come from here, right. And uh, then you also require the enzyme, right, and then you also require the buffers and you also require the, uh, the water. So, looking at these, uh, you are actually requiring the template DNA that is a very, very important. So, template DNA could be of different types, it could be a genomic DNA, it could be a DNA fragments, it could be a plasmid, it could be a virus, right, or it could be a tissue sample, or it could be the blood itself, right. Tissue sample means it could be a blood from a crime scene, okay. That is why we are actually going to be, that is why the, the PCR is a very, very robust technique to utilize for the investigating the criminal sites and identifying the criminals and so on. So, uh, depending upon the different types of the templates, you are supposed to use the, uh, the appropriate uh, concentration so that the, you will get the amplified product. Then you require the primers, so you are actually require the two different types of primers, you require a forward primer and a reverse primer. Remember that when you are going to start with a double standard template, right, which is actually going to be bound to each other by a hydrogen bonding. So, if you heat this at 95 degrees Celsius, remember that this is like 5 prime to 3 prime and this is 3 prime to 5 prime. So, uh, if you heat it at 95 degrees Celsius, it is actually going to give you the two templates, right. It is going to give you a 3 prime to 5 prime and the uh, 5 prime to 3 prime, right. These are the two templates you get, right. This is the one template, this is the second template, right. So, this is the one, right. So, the forward primer will sit here, forward primer will sit into your template number one and the reverse primer will sit onto the uh, forward primer. Reverse primer will sit onto this because it will sit from here, right? That is that's why it is called as reverse primer. And these primers will have a sequence complementary to the sequence in the template DNA where they are supposed to start the synthesis. Although the primer synthesis and the primer designing is a very very important aspect of performing a PCR, but since it is beyond the scope of the current uh, lecture, I have not discussed that. But if you want to discuss or if you want to know about that, then you can be able to take any of the, uh, you know, the resources on online resources like the YouTube and all those kind of videos and it is actually going to give you a very good understanding about how you can be able to design the primers, how you can be able to perform the PCR. Then we also require the enzyme, okay. So, the tag DNA polymerase is, is from the thermus acuticus. 
which is a microbe which is found in the 176 degrees Celsius hot springs and uh, tag DNA polymerase is stable in a high temperature and act in the presence of magnesium. The optimal temperature for the tag polymerase is 72 degrees Celsius. But apart from these kind of advantages, there are disadvantages of using the tag DNA polymerase. One of the major advantage, major disadvantage is that a tag DNA polymerase lacks the 3 time to 5 prime exonucleus activity which is commonly found in the other polymerases and because it does not have the proof reading activity it is actually going to incorporate the wrong nucleotide into the sequence. So, it actually incorporates one base pair out of the 10 to power 4 bases. This means it is actually going to give you the mutations when you are going to synthesize the template DNA of the very large size. So, a 400 base pair target will contain an error of 33 percent of the molecule after the 20 cycles right. An error distribution is going to be random that is very very problematic because in some sequences the nucleotide number 50 is going to be get mutated in some sequences the nucleotide number 80 is going to be get mutated and so on and because of this random mutations, you may actually end up in getting a PCR amplified product which will be mutated in multiple places. Now, what is the alternative? The alternative is that you can be able to use the PFU DNA polymerase uh, from the pyrococcus and that actually uh, processes the 3 prime to 5 prime exonucleus uh, proofreading activity. The error rate is only 3.5 percent. So, it is much better than the, uh, the, than the, uh, poly the tag DNA polymerases. Now, once you are done with the PCR, you are going to run the PCR product onto the agarose and you are going to um, check the amplified product. So, what you are going to see is this is the control reaction and this is the positive control. This is the positive where you added the primers and this is the control where you have actually removed the templates. So, what you see here is the once the PCR is completed, the amplified product is loaded into the agarose gel and observed after the ethidium bromide staining using the UV light. A water blank reaction is included to monitor the cross contaminated DNA source as a template. The percentage of agarose depends on the DNA to be visualized generally 0.8 to 1 percent agarose is used for analyzing the 0.5 to 5 kb amplified DNA while a DNA of larger size is visualized in a gel as low as 0.5 percent. So, what you see here is this is the amplified product what you are going to get after the PCR and that will ensure that you are actually getting the PCR amplified product because this is the uh, water control which means here I have ordered the water instead of template. Here we have added the template and that is why you are actually getting a amplified product. What is the advantage of PCR? So, uh, PCR is uh, very fast, it is easy to use, yeah, it is a content mixing and then you just set the different temperatures and it's, it is very sensitive and it is very robust. So, it is reproducible actually. But what is the limitation of the PCR? There is a limitation of the PCR that it needs for the target DNA sequence information, right? Because until you do not have the target sequence inf DNA information, you cannot be able to synthesize or you cannot be able to design the primers. And once until you do not have the primers, you cannot be able to perform the PCRs. So, it actually going to uh, having the this is a major disadvantage of a PCR that you actually have to design the primers and uh, if you cannot be able to design the primer because you do not know the DNA sequences then you cannot be able to perform the PCR. Then the second point is the fidelity of the DNA applications like for example, the tagged DNA polymerase there is no proofreading activity. So, it is actually going to create uh, 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 induce the mutations. Then the third is the short sizes and limited amount of PCR product which means like uh, uh, up to 5 kb the PCR is ok because you can be able to perform the PCR, but from beyond the 5 kb like for example, if you want to amplify the 40 kb then it, it will be very difficult and it will actually going to incorporate lot of mutations and it cannot amplify any gene which is more than 100 kb and cannot be used for the genome sequencing projects. Now, this is the simple PCR where you are actually going to amplify the DNA and it is actually going to be used. Now, these are the PCR can be modified according to your requirement and that can be used for, uh, for 
uh, addressing the different types of questions. One of such PCR is called as the semi quantitative PCR. Semi quantitative PCR is a or semi qPCR is a variant of the traditional PCR that estimate the amount of static material in a sample by comparing the intensity of the protein band on a gel, right. So, what is the what is the basic uh, purpose of the semi quantitative PCR is that it is actually going to calculate the starting material right. Remember that I have shown you a equation that which allows you to predict what will be the amplified DNA product right and that is linked to the amount of genomic DNA right. So, if you start with one strand and if I say okay, after the um, 4 cycles you are actually getting the 32 right. So, if I am getting the 32 strands right, if I am getting a 32 strand amplified product, I will can be able to go back and say okay, I am having a 1 strand ok. This is what exactly going to be the purpose of having a semi quantitative PCR. So, what will you what you are going to do is you are just going to uh, uh, do a PCR and then after the PCR you are going to run it on a agarose right and you are actually going to get the amplified product. Now, what you do is you estimate these DNA and uh, by estimation you going to you know you because you how many cycles you have done you have done for 30 cycles right. So, you can actually go back and ask what will be the starting material reactions or so, what will be the amount of template DNA present in this versus this. So, semi qPCR given an approximate measurement of DNA or RNA level which is useful for comparing the relative expression level during the different samples right. So, this will actually going to be very useful for asking the questions which one has the more DNA right. So, this means that particular condition is having which one has a more DNA this means this particular type of product is more pro prominent or more dominant in that particular type of experimental status. Semi quantitative PCR relies on the amplified target DNA sequence to PCR and subsequent analysis of the amplified product. By running the PCR product on an agarose gel and comparing the band intensities, researcher can infer the relative abundance of the target sequence into the different templates. What are different steps are involved ok. So, steps involved in semi quantitative PCR you are going to have the template DNA right. So, you are going to first you are going to prepare the sample. So, you extract the DNA or RNA from the sample. If RNA is extracted convert it into cDNA using the reverse transcription. Then you are going to have the PCR setup. So, you are going to have the PCR reaction. So, you design and synthesize the specific primer for the target gene and a reference housekeeping gene. The reference gene should have the stable expression across the different samples. Prepare the PCR reaction mixture including the template DNA, primers, GNTPs, buffer and DNA polymerases. Then you are going to do the PCR. So, you are going to set up the PCR conditions right. So, perform the PCR with an optimized number of cycles keeping the number of cycle in an exponential amplification phase is crucial for ensure the semi quantitative results. Typically 20 to 35 cycles are used include a negative control that is no templates uh, and a positive control which is known which you, where, where you know the quantity of the templates. Then you are actually going to separate these onto agarose gel right and uh, you can actually be able to use the staining dye like the ETBR or the cyber. Use a DNA ladder to estimate the size of the PCR product. And then number 5 you can actually be able to visualize the gel under the UV and capture the image using a gel documentation system. Analyze the band intensities using the image software or by visual comparison and number 6 you are going to do the normalization which means you are actually going to see what will be the uh, intensity of the housekeeping genes, what will be the intensity of your template and then you are going to keep housekeeping gene as like 1 right and that is how you are going to normalize the intensity of the target gene bending to reference gene to the account for variety of loading and the PCR efficiency. Now, what is the application of the semi quantitative uh, PCR right. So, you can be able to do the gene expression analysis right. So, compare the expression level of the specific gene under the different experimental conditions. 
you can be able to validate the RNA sequencing results. So, validate finding from the high throughput RNA sequencing results. You can be able to detect uh, particular pathogens. So, detect and estimate the abundance of the pathogen DNA and RNA in clinical or the environmental setup. Then number 4, you can be able to do the genotype. So, differentiate between the genotype based on the presence and absence of the specific PCR product. And number 5, you can be able to do the mutation analysis. So, detect and estimate the frequency of mutation in a target sequences. Now, what will be the advantage of semi quantitative PCR versus the traditional PCR? So, it is more cost effective. Um, so, basic PCR reagents and a standard gel electrophoresis equipments are required. Then it is easy to use, simple to perform and analyze with the minimum specialized equipments. And number 3, the relative quantifications allow for the comparison of relative expression level between the samples. Apart from that, what is the limitation of the semi quantitative PCR? So, uh, it has uh, the limited uh, precisions, right? So, it provides approximate quantification, not the absolute values. Then it also has the gel analysis variability subject to variability in gel electrophoresis and staining, the leading to the potential inconsistencies. Number 3, the amplification plateau. If two many cycles are used, the PCR may reach a plateau phase where the differences in the starting material are no longer distinguishable. Then number 4, it is labor intensive because more labor intensive and time consuming than the real time PCR or the uh, RT PCR. Then the second uh, modification is the rever reverse time. Uh, reverse transcription PCR or the RT PCR. So, reverse transcription uh, PCR or the RT PCR is a powerful technique used to study the gene expression. It is done by converting the RNA into the complemented DNA and then amplifying the specific three DNA sequences using the polymerase chain reactions. This method allows the researchers to quantify and analyze messenger RNA in various samples, providing the insight into gene expression pattern using the different conditions. RT-PCR contains the two steps, reverse transcription which converts the RNA into the complementary strand using the enzyme reverse transcriptase and the polymerase chain reactions which amplify the specific cDNA sequences using the DNA polymerases. So, this is exactly what you are going to do, you are going to uh, take the tissue or cell which will be your target uh, sample, right? you are going to isolate the uh, total RNA and that we have already discussed, right? remember that we have discussed about when we were discussing about the CDN la library preparation. So, you are going to have the uh, RNA messenger, R uh, messenger RNA and the step 1 you are actually going to design the first strand synthesis so that you are going to have the cDNA and then from the cDNA you are going to have the double standard DNA and that you are you are going to remove the RNA right with the help of the RNAs H treatment and then this you can be able to use for the amplifications. So, what you are going to require for transcript, uh, reverse transcription PCR you are going to have the RNA extractions. So, extract the total RNA or messenger RNA from the sample using the standard RNA extraction technique. Ensure the RNA integrity by checking onto the growth gel or using a bioanalyzers. And then you are going to have the reverse transcriptions to prepare the reverse transcription reaction mixture which includes the RNA templates, reverse transcriptase, enzyme, primers, DNTPs, reverse transcription buffer and RNA buffer uh, inhibitor. Incubate the reaction mixture at the appropriate temperature for 30 to 60 minutes to synthesize the cDNA. Then, then stay, uh, step number 3, you are going to have the PCR amplifications. So, prepare the PCR reaction mixture which contains the cDNA, DNTPs and PCR buffer. Perform the PCR using the appropriate cyclic conditions and repeat the cycles for 25-35 to amplify the target DNA. And then the step 4, you are going to analyze the uh, PCR product. So, run the PCR product on an agarose gel to separate them based on the size, stain the gel with a uh, ATPR or the cyber green and uh, visualize under the UV light. Analyze the band intensity to estimate the abundance of the target sequences. So, this is what exactly you are going to do. In the uh, first step, you are going to have the RNA template, you are going to do the reverse transcriptions and 
uh, you are going to synthesize the cDNA, then you are going to put the cDNA into the PCR amplifications and you can actually be able to analyze the PCR product. Now, if you want to do this, you can actually have the two options in the you can actually be able to do one step PCR amplifications or the two step PCR amplifications. So, in the two step in the one step you actually can add the DNA polymerase buffers, GNTPs everything into the reaction mixture. So, what will happen is the RT PCR is going to synthesize the cDNA and then this cDNA is going to be utilized as a template by the DNA polymerase to give you the amplified product. Whereas, in the two step PCR uh, first you are going to add the uh, react conditions for the reverse transcriptase, you are going to get the cDNA, then you take this cDNA and put it into the PCR reactions into the second step and that is how you are going to get the amplified product. What is the amplification uh, application of the RT PCR? So, you can actually be able to use the RT PCR for the gene expression analysis you can be able to do the RT PCR for the detection of the viral RNA, then you can actually be able to use the RT PCR for the quantitative RT PCR. So, combine the RT PCR with the real time PCR to obtain the quantitative data on the gene expression analysis. This involves monitoring the amplification process in a real time using the fluorescent dye or the probe. You can actually be able to use this for the cDNA cloning and you can also be able to use this for the mutational analysis. What is the advantage of the RT PCR? So, it is very sensitive compared to the traditional PCR. So, it can detect the amplified low abundance RNA transcripts. Uh, number 2, it is very specific. So, it, it is precise due to the uh, use of the gene specific primers. Number 3, it is versatile. So, applicable to a wide range of RNA samples including the total RNA, messenger RNA and the viral RNA. Then it is easy to quantification. So, when combined with the real time PCR, the quantitative piece measurement of gene expression levels are provided. Now, this, these are the advantages. What are the limitations of the RT PCR? Number 1, the RNA quality. Okay. So, requires the high quality intact RNA, degraded RNA can lead to the poor cDNA synthesis and the amplifications. Number 2, you require the primer designing, this requires the careful designing of primer to ensure specificity and efficacy. Then you require the contamination, so high sensitive ma makes uh, RT PCR susceptible to the contamination which can lead to the false positive results. And number 4, uh, it requires the appropriate normalization control like the housekeeping genes for the RNA quantity and the quality variations. And to avoid these kind of limitations, people have started using the quantitative PCR or the RTQPCR. So, what is the quantitative PCR or the uh, RTQPCR? So, real time PCR or the quantitative PCR is a laboratory technique to amplify and quantify a target DNA molecules. The amplification is the same as the traditional PCR reactions. The amplicon detection method differ from the traditional PCR and RT PCR or the qPCR. Uh, in this method, the fluorescent markers are used which have specific binding affinity to the double standard DNA. When bound to the double standard DNA, they exhibit the fluorescent behavior. Fluorescent emission is detected and quantified by the detector. The amount of fluorescence emitted is directly proportional to the double standard PCR product. The two different types of PCR uh, fluorescent dyes are intercalating dye like the cyber green and the probe based detection method. Quantification method. Uh, so, you can have the absolute quantification or the relative quantification. So, it involves creating a standard curve from the known concentration of the target DNA. The unknown samples are quantified by comparing their fluorescence to the standard curve. And then you can also have the relative quantification. So, you can compare the amount of target DNA in different sample to a reference gene or the sample. The delta uh, CT and the delta delta CT methods are the two most popular method. So, this is what exactly happened. You are going to have a CT value and you are going to get the uh, uh, non exponential play to phase. Okay. So, what is mean by the CT value? Okay. I am sure you might have heard about the CT value when you are uh, you know people were going for the COVID testing and all that. So, CT value or the threshold value is a is a crucial parameter in the real time PCR. It represents the cycle number at which the fluorescence generated within a reaction crosses the threshold level 
signifying the detectable PCR amplifications. So, you can actually have the absolute quantifications, you can actually have the relative quantifications. Now, what is the uh, application of the uh, RT PCR? So, you can actually be able to do the gene expression analysis. So, measure the expression level of the specific gene in the different samples. You can actually be able to do the pathogen detections. So, identifying and quantifying the bacterial, viral or fungal DNA in clinical or the experimental environmental samples. You can actually be able to do the genetic variations. So, detecting the mutations uh, SNPs and the other genetic variations and you can actually be able to do the DNA quantification. So, measuring the amount of DNA in sample applicable in the various research and the diagnostic context. Now, RT-PCR is, is a very, very robust technique for pathogen detection and that is why it is being used very extensively for testing the COVID-19. Okay? So, let us understand how people were using this particular technique for the COVID testing. I am sure you all will know about the COVID testing, right? You are COVID is a COVID-19 is a is a virus, right? And which actually causes a disease. So, on February 2020, the International Committee of Toxicology declared the COVID-19 as the pandemic, right? And the COVID-19 is an enveloped virus with crown-like spikes on its uh, other surfaces. The genome of the COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, is a single standard positive sense RNA of 30 KB with GC content of 38 percent. And this is what the structure of a COVID-19, what is given in your textbook, right? And it has the different types of the spike proteins, it has the different types of the coat proteins and so on. And then it also has the, um, the single standard RNA as a template, RNA as G genome, right? So, that RNA can be detected with the help of the real time PCR. Two third of the viral sample include the several non structural proteins, which include the pepane like proteases, uh, chymotrypsin like proteases, RNA dependent RNA polymerases, helicases, and exonucleases. The rest of the genome code for the accessory proteins such as spike proteins, small envelope uh, proteins, membrane protein, and the N proteins. Based on the structure of the genome, highly efficient RT-PCR tests have been designed as a diagnostic approach. The principle of the diagnostic kit is same as the original RT-PCR kit. The primer for the amplicons are designed by selecting the ORF1 and the viral nucleocaspid region. Swab of the upper and the lower respiratory tracts are taken and the RNA is purified from this swab. These purified RNA are then converted to cDNA and the amplified in a RT-PCR machine. So, what we do is we are actually going to collect the sample, right? From the sample, it is actually going to isolate uh, the RNA or I will say uh, RNA and then this RNA is going to be get converted into cDNA, right? And then this cDNA is going to be analyze into uh, RT-PCR reactions right? with the help of the cyber green and so on. Then what you are going to see is you are going to see uh, amplification of these right? and then you are actually going to set what will be the CT value. Okay? Now, if you are getting uh, every amplification, so you will take the number of cycles to reach to the CT value. right? For example, in this case it is taking 21 cycles to reach to the CT value. right? This means, if anybody crosses this value before 21, right? this means you are crossing it in 20 or 17 or 16, that will decide what the amount of the uh, virus present into this particular, uh, into the different samples. For example, if somebody is crossing this CT value in 30 or 40 cycle, then you can say that it is having a virus which is of very, very low values okay? and that could be actually a negative control. So, the fluorescent probes are designed so that they bind to the template molecules. During the amplification process, the tagged DNA polymerase cleave these probes nearly removing the quencher from the fluorescent molecule. This results in a rapid increase in the fluorescence. The increase in fluorescence is presented in a graph. The graph gives a CT value. 
which represent the number of cycle required for the PCR reaction to give us a fluorescence which is significantly distinguishable from the background. Okay? So, the CT value is going to say that how many cycles you actually performed so that you can be able to cross this a detectable level. Right? If the value of CT is less, it signifies that the PCR reaction requires the fewer PCR cycle to reach the threshold fluorescence, which means the signals from the genetic material in the PCR reaction, the infection is very, very severe, which means if you have lower CT value. So, if you have a low CT value, that will say that more sample or more, more RNA in the sample. That is why you are getting the uh, CT value at a low cycle number. But if the CT value is high, for example, then the less messenger RNA or less RNA present in the sample. RNA means virus, right? Because virus has the RNA as a genome, right? So this is virus, right? This means this guy is actually having a severe infection and this guy is actually having a milder infection because his CT value is very high. For example, if you have a CT value of 18, then it is very, very high. If you have a CT value of 32, then it is either not having the infection or it is actually having the infection which is of a milder level. So, this is all about the detection of COVID-19 using the RT-PCR. You will, you will get ample number of uh, important videos onto the YouTube if you would like to see the whole procedure. And I will strongly recommend that you should be able to see those videos so that how people are collecting the samples from the nose, how you are collecting the sample from the, you know, the uh, mouth and then how they are isolating the RNA and how you, they are actually performing the real time PCR and then how they were actually calculating the CT values. So, this is all about the PCR, what we have discussed, we have discussed about the PCR can be classified in three types based on the type of detection method and there are different quantification methods that can one quantify the different PCR product and PCR can be performed with both DNA and RNA and there are de definite types of applications of the PCR in terms of the diagnostics uh, of the infectious agents. We have just discussed about how you can be able to detect the COVID-19 and so on. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss some more aspect related to gene cloning. Thank you.